course, you know, state allocation of capital is far from efficient, right? Um, private allocation of capital um, is too risky and has moral hazard problems, but state allocation of, of funds also has moral hazard problems and is very inefficient. Uh, <clears throat> so on the one hand, that's a good thing. Um, they can do things like capital control. Right? So the reason why capital control is fairly effective in China is because they control all the formal financial institutions. And so if you want to have hot money inflow or outflow, you have to do it through underground banks. Uh, that's very costly and it's hard to do. Whereas in Latin America, it was much harder um, for them to have capital control because banks were privately owned. Um, and also they can do things like pump you know, a massive amount of money into the, the economy in a very short time. So this is something that the U.S. Uh, has problem doing because you know, we're a democracy, so things have to be debated in, in, uh, in the Senate, in the House. Uh, but China can basically issue an order to all the financial institutions to start lending. So what you see um, in January, for example, the, the lending in January in China was just spectacular. Um, there was I think 1.7 trillion RMB in lending in January. That's equivalent to a third of all the lending that happened in 2008, right? So, so China can do things like that. That's you know sort of in a market economy, it's very hard to do. But when the government controls all the banks in China, um, they can do that. But on the other hand, the allocation of capital I think is hugely inefficient, right? So. Um, I, in my mind, some sort of healthy, healthy growth, um, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, I think healthy growth is, is sort of from private industries and also partly from consumption. But if you look at growth in China, most of the growth that was generated, generated in the past, uh, especially in the past 10, 15 years, was really from the healthy growth part is from export. And the other main sources of growth um, were government spending and also investment that's related to government entities, right? So investment by state owned enterprises, investment by local governments. Um, consumption, which of course um, we in the United States do too much of, but you know, it tends to be um, a main source of growth in, in most country, is actually extremely weak in China. So to give you a sense, uh, consumption, domestic consumption as a share of GDP has actually declined from over 50% in the 80s to just 35% in 2007, right? So I mean, that I think that's pretty rare, right, uh, Mark? <laughs> I mean, can, yeah, so so what it means, so so, so then um, there was this great paper in the IMF actually just did a couple years ago, so they inquired, why is consumption so low in China? And it's because uh, household disposable income as a share of GDP has fallen very seriously, um, actually again from over 50, well over 50% in the 80s, uh, now to you know, 20, 30%. Um, so uh, most of the money is actually aggregated in the state or state control entity, right? In the hands of state bureaucrats, a uh, few real estate developers who are relatives of state bureaucrats. Um, and so, I mean, on the one hand, they can mobilize cash, mobilize money in very, very quick order. Uh, they can do a lot with that. They can do these amazing public projects, which we wouldn't dream of, like the Three Gorges Dam. There is a plan now to move water from southern China to northern China. These things cost trillions of RMB to do. They can do it because the government still controls all the financial institutions. But on the other hand, the allocation of capital is going to be pretty inefficient. Um, and growth is generated by the only sort of efficient growth in China is from the export sector. The export sector is efficient because they have to compete, of course, with the rest of the world. But the problem now is that export has completely stalled. Um, China has had three months in a row of negative export growth. In January, export actually declined by 17%. Of course, some people say, well, that's because the Chinese New Year was in January. That's true, but even if you adjust for that, um, so even if these things are calculated year on year, year on year growth. So Chinese New Year was like February last year or something like that, so of course you can't compare. But even if you adjust for that, um, the decline in export was between 5 to 7% in January. Um, so then the only source of growth now is this hugely inefficient state investment. And the state, of course, is doing all that it can to generate growth in 2009. It has a 4 trillion RMB stimulus package, 
much of it is not financed by the budget. Much of it is financed by banks, right? So, so unlike in the U.S., you know, in the U.S., we want to finance Obama's stimulus package, as we debated in Congress, because taxpayers will eventually have to pay for it uh, from bond issuances, right? So the government issues bonds. In China, the government will issue some bonds to pay for a quarter of the stimulus package, but the rest, they will just go to the banks and say, give us money, which, of course, the U.S. government, well, okay, now that the banks are nationalized, I guess we could do that if we wanted to. <laughs> um, but before last uh, November or so, we couldn't do it. Um, so so the, the state allocation of capital gets more serious. Uh, it's it's going to generate a lot of non-performing loans. My expectation is this. Um, and at the same time, the employment is not. So the, the problem is that the reason why I say the export se sector was very healthy growth is because it was generating employment that was increasing the income of the average Chinese workers. Now, unemployment in China is over 30 million people. So 30 million people in China are without jobs that they previously had. Uh, of course, many of them are sort of expected to go back to the farm, but their monthly income then collapses precipitously. You know, in, if you have a nice factory job in Shenzhen or Dongguan, you're making over 1,000 RMB a month. If you go back to your hometown and farm, I mean, you're making one or 200 RMB a month uh, at the most, right? Um, so there's a lot of frustrated expectation. There's really high unemployment, which I think is going to blow 50 million, I'm pretty sure. And so, well, what's the percentage? And 30 million is basically 8% of the labor force. So, so unemployment in, in China is basically 8%, which is quite high um, for a country like China. Um, I think the probability of mass urban instability is, what is increasing at this point. Um, not so much in cities like Guangdong, uh, Guangzhou and Shanghai, um, but in a lot of cities are inland cities where a lot of migrant workers come from. So what's happening now is uh, many of them go to Guangdong, they can't find jobs, they go back to the hometown, there are no job opportunities there, so they go to the nearest cities, places like Changsha, Chengdu, to try to find a job. Um, they can't find jobs there, and then um, things can blow up. In the farmland, the problem is also very severe. As many of you know, China is experiencing the most severe drought in 50 years. Um, but I think the problem is a very long-term one, so this is related to um, what Mark said about the environment. Um, basically, years of government agricultural subsidies have encouraged people to uh, farm very water-intensive crops in northern China, which is water scarce, right? So, so when you give people extra money to, to do something, they'll do it even though they really shouldn't, you know, if there's a free market uh, operating in the market. Um, so even before the current drought, scientists were uh, estimating that the deep aquifer in northern China was dropping at a rate of three meters a year. Right. Um, interestingly, they stopped publishing the statistics on the deep aquifer in 2001. So, so we don't even know. Uh, we've heard that now farmers have to drill one kilometer below ground to get water, actually. And the, of course, the farm subsidies makes it much, much worse, right? So without the farm subsidies, um, farmers wouldn't farm. But because China wants so-called food security, which is they want to be self-sufficient in basic crops, the government is paying huge subsidies to farmers to plant crops like uh, corn, rice, and wheat. So they want self-sufficiency in grain, basically grain self-sufficiency. Um, so farmers are digging deeper, using more and more money to dig wells deeper and deeper to uh, farm. Um, and I think, you know, we don't know, you know, what level the aquifer is at at this point, but if this continues and if the rain pattern doesn't change decisively in favor of northern China, then I think we're going to see a desertification. So northern China is going to turn into a desert, basically, in a generation's time. Um, now, imagine what that, what impact that's going to have on on China economic, uh, economically. Uh, a lot of the wealth in China now, as many of you know, is trapped in real estate investment. Right. So people have invested their whole life savings, you know, years of future income in the real estate market, and this is especially severe in Beijing. With Beijing being one of the hottest real estate market in China. At the very extreme, if water literally runs out in northern.